Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Are you, are you here? Good morning. Happy Sabbath. All right, you're here. <laughs> We're going to continue our study on the early church, a church in formation. And that's us, right? We're a church in formation. So we're looking at the blueprint. We want to match the blueprint. I want to look like God's church as he designed it to be, don't you? All right. Well, where we left off last time, Jesus was about to send to, a hev to heaven to his father. And the disciples are charged up. They've spent the last 40 days with with uh, glimpses of Jesus, at times him teaching them personally. And many miracles have taken place. But Jesus says something very interesting to them. We read here in Acts 1, verses 4 and 5, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. And we talked about that last time. Waiting for the Spirit, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. They had some doctrinal issue, issues they were still working through. They had some personnel issues they were still working through, arguing about who is the greatest, jealousies among them. And so this comforter that was coming, there needed to be some preparation that they would do ahead of time in order to receive him. Isn't that right? Now, at the end of this text, it says that you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, that's, that's what we're going to look at this morning, a very interesting concept, a very solemn subject this morning. Now, we know that John, known as John the Baptist, was baptizing by the Jordan there, that he was a precursor to Jesus, preparing the way, if you will. We read in Matthew 3, verses 5 and 6, Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. This was a baptism by water, a baptism by immersion, right? Mark records that this baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. That water baptism uh, representing a death to self, a turning from the old life, a death and a resurrection now in the newness of life in Christ. But there are two baptisms spoken of in Scripture, one of water and one of fire, right? And so in Matthew 3, as John is leading up to the baptism of Christ, it says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and what? And fire. You know, I've often said, you, you want to know the difference between baptism of water and fire. You know, you take a piece of paper and you put it in water and you pull it out. What is it? It's, it's still paper, right? It's wet paper. What happens if you burn that paper? It's, it's not paper anymore. The whole makeup of the paper is so changed it will never be paper again. Isn't that true? What Jesus is offering is a baptism of the Holy Spirit, a baptism, if you will, of fire. Now what's interesting is that Jesus is our example in how many ways? Always, in all ways, he who would be the one who baptizes with fire also himself had to be what? Baptized with fire. That's right. We read about his baptism in Luke 3. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized by water. And while he prayed on the, on the bank there, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. Having to come and live this life as you and I live it, in the flesh and blood that you and I have, Jesus being the example in all things, not only baptized with water, but also baptized by the Holy Ghost baptized in fire. John says this in John chapter 1, John the Baptist, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending 
and remaining on Him. This is He who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Then we read in Luke 4, after that experience, that Jesus being filled with the Spirit. This is the first time in Scripture that Jesus is described this way. Filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And from that point forward, the beginning of His ministry, everything changes. We're going to look at evidence this morning. Evidence in three facets. Number one, was there evidence in the life of Christ that he was baptized by the Holy Spirit? Yeah, these aren't tough questions, right? These are very easy questions. The blind could see. The deaf could hear. The dead were raised. The maimed were made whole. I mean, everywhere he went, there was evidence after evidence that something supernatural was taking place. In John 5, Jesus said, but I have a greater witness than who? Than John's, than the Baptist. Jesus said, I have a greater witness than his for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, they bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Is that evidence? And who's doing the works, by the way? Is Jesus using his own divinity to do the works? No, it's the Father working through the Spirit through Christ, to do the works. Jesus said in John 10, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the what? Believe the works. They're the evidence that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. John 14, Jesus said it this way, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. And what were those works? Well, we talked about the healings and all the magnificent wonders that took place, but works of the Spirit, as you really analyze the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they come in two ways, in fruit and in gifts. Fruit and gifts. Let's look at the, at the fruit first. Galatians 5 tells us the fruit of the Spirit is what? It's love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Did Jesus manifest that fruit in his life? Easy answer. Absolutely. I mean, he was the embodiment of love, of joy, of peace. I mean, who else could sleep in a boat that was going down, right? He had a peace that passes all understanding. Was he long-suffering? Above and beyond anything you and I can imagine, he was long-suffering. He was kind, his goodness, his faithfulness, his love, even in rebuke to the religious leaders, we're told that there were tears in his voice. He still loved them, the ones that would spit on him and whip him and tie him to that cross and nail him to that cross. He, from that very vantage point and experience, would say, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus embodied the fruit of the Spirit. Can you say amen? What about the gifts? I mean, there's several lists of gifts in Scripture. This one, 1 Corinthians 12. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits. Did Jesus manifest these gifts in his life and ministry? Yeah. The religious leaders were often perplexed at his ministry because of the supernatural nature of what was happening. How could they defy the fact that the blind could see, the deaf could hear, that the dead were resurrected? As much as they disagreed with what he was teaching, what could they say about those manifestations? John 7, 15, and the Jews marveled, saying, how does this man know letters having never studied? That's the gift of knowledge. Then the priest came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why have you brought him? Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. Wow, that's the gift of wisdom. Matthew 9, 4, but Jesus knowing their thoughts, what did he know? Their thoughts, I can tell you right now, I do not know your thoughts, rest assured, right? But did Jesus, through the gift of the Holy Spirit, have the ability to read thoughts? 
to know things that nobody else could know, that's one of the gifts. John 1, Jesus answered and said to him, he's speaking to Nathanael, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Jesus manifested the gifts and the fruit of that spirit. It was evidence all through his life. Acts 2, verse 22, we're told men of Israel hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. And with what? Power. What did Jesus tell the disciples to wait for? And you will receive power. And it goes on to say, he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Evidence number two. Does God want that kind of experience to be the experience of his believers, of his disciples? Well, we don't have to look any farther than the early church, right? This is the same evidence, the same experience that they then would go through. John 14 and verse 12, Jesus said to his disciples, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do. Why? Because I go to my Father, and when he goes to his Father, what's he going to do? He's going to send the Helper, the Holy Spirit. And he says, greater works than I've done, you will do. I want to read something to you from Desire of Ages. Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him. Do you believe that? If we're to walk as he walked, then the ability to do the things he did must be at your fingertips and my fingertips as well. Would you agree with that? Did he not tell his disciples they would receive power? He did. He told them that they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. When he went up and the Holy Spirit came down, he came with gifts and with power to deliver to those disciples. Pentecost, if you will, is kind of like the Bethlehem of the Holy Spirit, right? When you think about those early days in the book of Acts, were there healings? Were there resurrections? Were there people that were prophesying? Was there discernment? Did Peter know that Ananias and Sapphira had, had held back some of the money that they had dedicated to the Lord? That's discernment. He knew something that wasn't revealed but by the Spirit, amen? Miracles, signs, and wonders. Some have actually said, and I agree, maybe, maybe the book Acts of the Apostles should rightly be named Acts of who? The Holy Spirit, right? Acts 2 and verse 43, as you follow their experience, then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. The evidence of the Spirit, the, the manifestation of the Spirit was so overwhelming in that early church that it really became sort of the litmus test of whether or not the believers were sincere and fitted for action. Let me show you a couple examples. In Acts chapter 6, as they're told to seek out men who will take the place, we believe this to be the first uh, ordinance, really, of deacons in the church. Notice what it says, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, and then what else? Full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Now, in choosing these deacons, there must have been some kind of evidence as to the Holy Spirit in their lives. Would you agree with that? I mean, we don't walk around with tags, say, I am Sam, I am full of the Holy Spirit, right? There must be some kind of witness or evidence of that power in your life. Would you agree with that? How then would we choose able-bodied men according to this criteria if there's no evidence for such power? Who was one of the first deacons we know by name? Stephen was one of the ones chosen. What do we see in Stephen's life? Acts 6, verse 8, just a few verses later. And Stephen, full of faith and what? Power did great what? Wonders and signs among the people. I, I ask you a very simple question again. Did Stephen 
have evidence that he had been baptized by the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. He met the criteria. Later in the book of Acts, Peter and John are sent to Samaria to check as to why the new believers there had not received the Holy Spirit. We read about it in Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. This was so important to them. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They, then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. There it is again. Now it doesn't say in what capacity, you know, did they speak in tongues, these new languages that they could minister to other nations, or what was the manifestation? The Bible doesn't tell us. But here's the point, brothers and sisters. Something happened that revealed power because there was a sorcerer in that town by the name of Simon, and when he saw that, he said, I want some of that. And he was willing to pay money for it, right? We read in Acts chapter 8, verses 18 and 19, and when Simon, that sorcerer, saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, give me this what? Power. Also, that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. There was evidence, there was a moving of the Holy Spirit in that early church that was undeniable. What about Saul, who later would be named Paul, as he's blinded on that road to Damascus? Did he need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit? What do you think? Yeah. yeah. Acts chapter 9 and verse 17, Ananias is sent to him. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and what? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now Saul's an interesting case because he was actually baptized, or I'm sorry, he actually received the Holy Spirit before he was baptized with water. And we'll see that in, in the New Testament here, that sometimes you can be baptized by the Spirit, then later you get baptized by water. Sometimes you're baptized by water and later by the Holy Spirit. Acts 9, 18, immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was what? Baptized. So filled with the Spirit, then baptized. Different order. Was there evidence in Paul's ministry of the baptism of the Spirit? Are you still here? Okay. I told you I can't read your thoughts. I mean, I don't know what you're thinking about. I mean, you could... Could be the chores of next day, or I don't know what's going on, but was there evidence that Paul was baptized by the Holy Spirit? Yes. yes. Acts 19. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Signs and wonders and miracles. The Holy Spirit moving in tremendous power. In Romans 15, Paul even, even talks about the fact that this power needs to be evident. He says, For I will not dare to, spe to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. So that from Jerusalem and round about to uh, Illyri Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. I should have practiced that one ahead of time. He says in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 5, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in what? Power. And in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. 1 Corinthians 2, he says this, And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of what? Power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Are you seeing a reoccurring theme here? Power, demonstration, right? 1 Corinthians 4, 19 and 20, he says, But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord wills, and I will know, not the word of those who are puffed up, but the what? 
but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Paul looked for the power among the believers as evidence as to whether or not they were in the faith or not. At one point, he's traveling through Ephesus. He would find believers that had not even known that there was a Holy Spirit, and it was important to Paul that they receive the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 19, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And Paul said, That doesn't matter. As long as you receive the word, right? Is that what he said? No. And he said to them, Into what were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Remember, his was a baptism of repentance, right? Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and was their power. They spoke with tongues or other languages and prophesied, the gift of prophecy working through these new believers. Evidence number three. Now we need a mirror. What is evidence number three? Is that power working in you and me today? Does God want that power in you and that power in me? Most of us here were baptized with water. Some are studying here to be baptized with water. Praise the Lord, right? A public profession of our faith. But have we been baptized by the Holy Spirit? That's the question this morning. Jesus said, you will receive power. Just like the disciples of old who were so excited to begin that work, the gospel commission, they were helpless to do so without the power from on high. Would you agree with that? Brothers and sisters, we are in the same boat. Without the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, it will be fruitless. Pen of inspiration. What we need is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Without this, we are no more fitted to go forth to the world than were the disciples after the crucifixion of their Lord. Jesus knew their destitution and told them to tarry in Jerusalem until they should be endued, endowed sorry, with power from on high. Another statement, there needs to be a waking up among God's people that his work may be carried forward with what? With power. We need what? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now maybe you're feeling like I did when I first heard this. I'm, I'm praying about it, I'm studying it, and what is the question? The most sincere question everyone in here should be asking is, how do I know if I've been baptized by the Holy Spirit, right? Well, let's go back to the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It came in two forms. It was in fruit, and it was in gifts, right? Isn't that what Jesus demonstrated, the fruit and the gifts? Isn't that what the apostles demonstrated, the fruit and the gifts? What is the fruit? Let's look at it again. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Simple question that every one of us can ask ourselves in here. Are you easily agitated? Are you easily frustrated? Are you judgmental? Are you self-seeking? Are you any of the opposite of these things on the screen? And then the painful answer must come back. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And by the way, this is not a smorgasbord. This list is not like, well, I have joy, but I need to work on goodness. I have faithfulness, but sometimes I, I get a little off track on the self-control. You do realize that this is an all-encompassing list. You know what's missing from the word fruit is an S, right? It doesn't say, but the fruits 
of the Spirit are, it says the fruit. You know, the Bible commentary had this to say, the fruit of the Spirit is not the natural product of human nature, but a power wholly outside of man. You agree with that? This is not try harder, folks. This is not grit your teeth and you can, you can manifest these things. I hope everybody understands that. What I'm talking about is supernatural, right? Attention may be called to the fact that the word fruit is in the singular. There is but one fruit of the Spirit, and that one fruit includes all the Christian graces enumerated in verses 22 and 23. In other words, all of these graces are to be present in the life of the Christian, and it cannot be said that he is bearing the fruit of the Spirit if any one is what? Missing. Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? I mean, is the Holy Spirit convicting your heart as much as he's convicting mine? Let's talk about the gifts. These are supernatural gifts. When we talk about, uh, we'll get with you later, when we talk about the gifts of the Spirit, and we're talking about wisdom and knowledge and faith and healings and miracles and discerning of spirits, now, now when we're talking about gifts, does everybody get the same gifts? No. This is different than the fruit. The gifts are manifested differently. But does everybody get one gift? Yes. Let me ask you something. If we are gifted by the Holy Spirit, will we need a test to take to see what gift we have? No. These gifts, when they are manifested, will be obvious, won't they? Now, am I saying that they're going to be comfortable, that tomorrow you're going to wake up and you're going to be like, I have the gift of public speaking, right? Are they going to be comfortable? I'm not saying that they'll be comfortable. God will lead us out of our comfort zone, won't he? But the manifestation of those gifts will not be questionable. They will be clear and distinctly supernatural, a gift from God and not from man. Amen? One of the greatest gifts is the fact that you and I, through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, will be victorious over temptation and sin. Can you say amen to that? Again, another supernatural gift from God. It's not about gritting your teeth and trying harder. It's about surrendering and said, God, say to God, you work through me. You send your spirit that he may put your life in my life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I underlined if, the biggest little word in all Scripture, right? If we are in Christ, we are a new creation. If we are not in Christ, then what are we? We are what we are and what we have been. And I don't want to be that anymore, do you? No. Ephesians 3, verse 20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. You know, it's an interesting thought. You know that the whole world right now could be converted to the Seventh-day Adventist church. Everyone in the entire world could be a Seventh-day Adventist right now, and Jesus would still not come. Do you agree with that? And Jesus would still not come. Why? Because, because what is Jesus waiting for? the manifestation of himself in his people, right? We know that quote. We probably even know the page from Christ Object Lessons that it comes from. Let's read it together. When the fruit... Well, this is the context of that statement, by the way. Notice, notice how it begins. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come. What is God waiting for? Fruit. Whose fruit? His fruit, right? The fruit of the Spirit. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. You notice in that statement, it doesn't say he is waiting for us to manifest him. He is waiting to manifest himself. Is there a difference? Yeah. See, I have a concern for my own life 
and I have a concern for the church at large, that most of us have been baptized with water, but that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is rarely talked about and even rarer still experienced. And as I study this in my own life, I am crying out to God like I never have before, baptize me, Lord, by your Spirit. I need it. And I recognize that at some point, I, I had experienced the beginnings of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How many can relate to that? When you first came to the Lord, you were on fire, right? You were like what Jesus described as that well of water that was springing up within and you couldn't contain it, right? But what happens in our Christian walk? We get lazy, right? We stop asking for the Holy Spirit. We start depending more on self. Rationalization creeps in. All kinds of things happen along the walk. Is this baptism of the Holy Spirit a once and done thing? How often must we ask for this? Every day. Every day. You know, in 2 Timothy, it gives this long list of horrible heathen people out in the world, right? These are lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. These are worldlings, right? No. It says having a form of what? Godliness. That means that they're in church. That means that they're passing the offering plate and who knows what else? They're, they're all around us. Why? And if you look in the mirror, it could be you. But then it says what? They deny its power. What did Jesus say? You will receive power. And if we are not receiving the power, what are we doing? We're, we're ignoring it. We're denying it. And Scripture says, and from such people turn away. I don't want to turn away from God, and I don't want you to turn away from me. I want the power to His glory and honor. Amen? So this is a daily thing. Christ Object Lessons, page 139. Daily, this is speaking of Jesus, He received a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the early hours of the new day, the Lord awakened him from his slumbers, and his soul and his lips were anointed with grace that he might impart to others. If Jesus needed this daily, how much more do we need this baptism of the Holy Spirit? Moment by moment, right? 1 Corinthians 15, 31, Paul says, I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. It's a renewing thing. 2 Corinthians 4, 16, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day, day by day. Again, from the pen of inspiration, we must have a living connection with God. We must be clothed with the power on high, from on high, by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that we may reach a higher standard. How many here would like to reach a higher standard? All right. And then she says, for there is help for us in no other way. Brothers and sisters, you can try to find a back door, a secret passage, a rope over the cliff. It doesn't exist. There is no other way to reach the higher plane than the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. I entreat the church members in every city that they lay hold upon the Lord with determined effort for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Be assured that Satan is not asleep. Oh, you try, you, you start down this path. Every obstacle possible he will place in the way of those who would advance in this work. Too often these obstacles are regarded as insurmountable. Let everyone now be soundly and truly converted and then lay hold of the work intelligently and with faith. You ever feel the enemy putting roadblocks up before you? You start to move closer to God, and what does the enemy do? Oh, no, you don't. Brothers and sisters, move forward. Trudge ahead. There is nothing, there is no obstacle that, that Christ cannot overcome that the devil will put before you. Amen? Amen? You know why it says in 2 Thessalonians, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan? And notice this, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Some would say, well, Sam, it's, you, you talked a lot about 
signs and miracles and wonders this morning, you do know that the enemy is going to work through signs, wonders, and miracles too, right? Yes? But should that keep us from doing the signs and wonders and miracles that God will work through us? You see, the enemy is just counterfeiting the true, isn't that right? And if this is happening in the last days, it tells me that we are the generation that God once again wants to move through his people in this capacity. Notice this. Pen of inspiration, the baptism of the Holy Ghost as on the day of Pentecost will lead to a revival of true religion and to the performance of many wonderful what? Works. Heavenly intelligences will come among us and men will speak as they are moved upon by the Holy Spirit of God. But should the work upon men as he did, but should the Lord, sorry, work upon men as he did on and after the day of Pentecost, many who now claim to believe the truth would know so very little of the operation of the Holy Spirit that they would cry, beware of fanaticism. They would say to those who are filled with the Spirit, these men are full of new wine, right? They would accuse those who are being led of the Holy Spirit of fanaticism because they know so little of the working of the Holy Ghost. I don't want to be among that crowd, do you? No. Another quote, impress upon all the necessity of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the sanctification of the members of the church so that they will be living, growing, fruit-bearing trees of the Lord's planting. Couple more and we're done. Oh, how we need the divine presence for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Every worker should be breathing out his prayer to God. Companies should be gathered together to call upon God for special help, help for heavenly wisdom, that the people of God may know how to plan and devise and execute the work. Can you say amen to that? That's what we just started back here this Sabbath. From 9.10 till 9.30 every week, we're going to be praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, amen? For God to lead us in work, for the members that are in bad health or other needs that arise, all those things as a group. Now, we're going to do this individual. This is an individual work, this pleading for the Holy Spirit. But collectively, we're going to come together and do the same thing as they did in the upper room. We need to pray as we never have prayed before for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, for if there was ever a time when we needed this baptism, it is now. Can you say amen to that? There is nothing the Lord has more frequently told us he would bestow upon us and nothing by which his name would be more glorified in bestowing than the Holy Spirit. When we partake of this spirit, men and women will be born again. Souls once lost will be found and brought back. How many here have a list of people you would like to see brought back into the fold? Amen. May I suggest that it will be through the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we experience, that will then be an influence upon them and they will come back. How much are we to ask for this? Until we get it. You ever ask for something when you were a kid in the grocery store or witness a child asking for something in the grocery store? Eventually what happens to the parent? They break. They break. I've seen it in the grocery store so many times. I want to buy the toy. You ever been in an experience like, just how much is the toy? Just give it to you. I'll buy the toy, right? <clears throat> what did Jesus say? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask for him? He is on the edge of his throne, just hoping that you will ask, that I will ask. Brothers and sisters, the work ahead of us is impossible. You do realize that, right? You've seen the roadblocks ahead of us. You know the persecution that's coming, the things that are about to break on this world. All this cannot be accomplished by head knowledge. We will need, desperately need, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There needs to be a supernatural manifestation of Jesus in each and every one of us to complete this work. And by God's grace, I want to be a part of that, don't you? Amen. Let's stand together for our